I disconnected my people being Christians from my people ethnically. Mm. And I started to associate myself more with my ethnic people, people of the flesh, as I, more than I did with my people who were of the faith. Welcome to the Elisa Childers Podcast. I've got a great guest to introduce you to today, but for context, we've done some episodes on something called critical race theory, critical theory, and often I think concepts like that can be difficult for us to get our hands around. Like, what do we mean when we're talking about critical race theory and critical theory? There's this sort of critical theory proper that's this very academic discussion, and then there is how critical theory and critical race theory seem to be manifesting in churches and in families. And that's really what we're going to talk about today. It's this whole idea of this movement that's coming into Christianity. Some might call it woke Christianity. Some might call it wokeism, cultural Marxism. You've heard it referred to as so many different uh, things with different titles. And it seems like in the past few years, uh, many churches have begun to shift their focus from an emphasis on teaching scripture to an emphasis on things not found in scripture, maybe shifting focused from uh, the atonement of Jesus on the cross to more of an emphasis on social justice. And so my guest today is someone who has lived this. This is a, a person who went through woke Christianity, bought into its tenets and ideas, saw uh, how damaging and destructive it can actually be in churches and in families. And I'm so excited to bring him on to share share his story today. Pastor Edwin Ramirez, so great to have you on the show. Thanks for being here. God bless you, sister. Thank you for having me. Well, it's such a joy to have you on. I've watched several of your videos, and for people watching, uh, you can find more content from Edwin on uh, the Proverbial Life podcast, and that's on YouTube as well. He's also the pastor of Faith Bible Chapel in Buffalo, New York. And uh, Edwin, I, I wanted to have you on because I really want to help people understand, A, from somebody who's kind of walked through this, but also you're a pastor. You have a pastor's heart, and I want to analyze what we're seeing happen in the church from the perspective of a pastor you know, who has a heart for the church, a heart for God's sheep. And so for, for those who may not be familiar with you or your work, tell us just a little bit about yourself, and then we'll, we'll just go from there. Yeah, sure. So uh, my name is Edwin Ramirez. I'm the pastor of Faith Bible Chapel, as Alyssa mentioned. And the uh, what an honor it is uh, to to be so and to to preach Christ on a weekly basis and to shepherd God's flock. And you know, as you were giving me the introduction and talking about the the uh, the woke movement and my former involvement, which we'll get into in a moment, I'm thinking to myself, I don't know how I could properly shepherd God's flock and still hold to those ideas that I held to uh, several years ago. And so I, I hope that we get into that um, some more. Uh, as far as the YouTube channel, I have a YouTube channel, The Proverbial Life, and really there we just want to look to Christ. And that's the model, uh, look to Christ, live wisely and leave a legacy behind for generations to follow. I want to equip people with God's word and encourage them to see the fulfillment of Christ and be satisfied in him. And then the responsibility of training our children and discipling our wives and wives, you know, vice versa, loving their husbands and, and so on and so forth. And so really just taking the Christian walk and applying it uh, to every area of our lives is really the desire of the channel and what I try to live out in my life. Well, and I love that your heart comes so much from a place of wanting to point people to Christ. And of course, sometimes in doing that, we have to reject and call out certain doctrines. But I love that your focus is, yeah, we have to call that stuff out. But ultimately, the goal is to disciple and to point people toward the truth and the joy and the life that we find in Christ and uh, in the true gospel. And so let's, let's just get our hands around your story a little bit. So we talked before we went on the air that you grew up in Long Island, which I have, you know, a, a special place in my heart for New York and especially Long Island because I have some friends out there and I had uh, attended a church out there for a few years, or not 
a couple years when I lived in New York. Uh, so, so talk to us about growing up. Did you grow up in a Christian home? And if, you know, when did you become a Christian? How did that happen? Yeah, this, that's great. Yeah. So I was not raised in a Christian home. Um, my stepfather uh, raised me, um, met my stepfather when I was three, uh, didn't know my biological father, met him one time when I was 21 years old. Um, so it was, it was a blessing that my, my dad stepfather came into my life and just to be able to see a man and to, to, you know, have him to talk to and uh, all those sorts of things. And then uh, not also not be able to go to certain places. My stepdad was very strict. And in the moment I hated it and despised it, but it saved me from a lot of trouble growing up. Uh, and so when I was three, my mother moved me out of the Bronx to Long Island. And I spent my uh, young adulthood there up until the age of about 21, 22, uh, moved out of the house and got into a lot of trouble. Fast forward, I would say about a, a year or two later, uh, about the age of 21, 22, the Lord saved me. Um, and yeah, so I had a, I had a very, um, I was a follower growing up uh, as a young adult, uh, always wanting to uh, do what others were doing. And the Lord was using that. He was drawing me to himself, um, you know, by virtue of different people in high school and out of high school sharing Christ with me. And it wasn't until later in life that the Lord really just got a hold of me and I came to faith in Christ. And yeah, then just been growing ever since. So that's kind of my yeah. you know, young adulthood. So now you had a brief sort of foray, foray into Jehovah's Witness. Is that right? Yes. Tell yeah, us about that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I had a good friend of mine, uh, his name is Herbie. That's my brother in the Lord now. Uh, he and I, uh, were just close, you know, as we can get, we, we, we spent time together and we were not believers at the time. And his cousin was a Jehovah's witness who was studying to be a doctor. And he would talk to us about Jehovah and we would have Bible studies. And, uh, I remember, uh, in fact, there were times when we were walking, Herbie and I, and there was a church right outside that said, Jesus is Lord. And we would say, you know, that's blasphemy and just say all sorts of things concerning Christ and how they were wrong and in error. And uh, I was working at a hospital and there was a man, I'll never forget him. He was about um, five, six, black man, uh, had a gold tooth in his mouth. And he asked me, if I was a Christian or what I believed. And I said, I said, yeah, I'm a Jehovah's witness. And I remember him just kind of smirking and laughing. And I just, the, the, the gold tooth was significant because I just remember him cocking his head back and seeing his tooth and thinking, this guy, like, what's so funny, you know? He, was, he said, I got something for you. Come in tomorrow and I have something for you. And so he gives me this tape, which dates me. He gives me this tape and he says, uh, I want you to listen to this. This is my pastor preaching a sermon about Jehovah's Witnesses. So I listened to the sermon and he was just going in on the false teaching of the Jehovah's Witnesses. And I just remember that doing something in me, like a shock. So I give it to my friend Herbie. He listens to it. And that was the beginning of what the Lord used to really bring us out of the kingdom hall. Mm. Uh, and something God used afterwards to give us an opportunity to share the faith with many Jehovah's Witnesses as well. So it's pretty neat to see God's providence and working through that co-worker and how he used that to bring me out of that cult. That's amazing. And I love how God sort of in his sovereignty leads us in and out of things like that so that we will have such a deep understanding so that we can help others and and share the gospel uh, in a way that's, you know, so compelling because we understand the other side of it, you know, whatever it is the Lord has walked us through. So let's let's talk about wokeism and just woke Christianity, whatever we want to call it. When did you begin to become what we might call woke? Was it before you were a Christian? Was it after? And how did that intersect with your Christianity? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, as I as I prepare to answer that question, I did want to say this. You know, the Lord is is working before, in the midst, and throughout the process of our lives. Um, and you know, I remember when I was an unbeliever, looking back, seeing the Lord working, 
You know, in the moment I didn't mm. see it. I was blind to my sin. I uh, didn't know the Lord, didn't want to know the Lord. And I look back and see the Lord drawing me to himself, bringing different people in my life, different relationships, allowing certain things to take place. Uh, and then and then being a Christian, I look back and see when I was involved in the woke movement, the Lord using different means to bring me out of that. But the, the, the beautiful thing about the Lord is that, uh, as we see in John 10, right, he knows his sheep. His sheep know his voice. And uh, the Lord promises that he will lose none of his own. And that's really an encouragement to us. He, he saves us and he keeps us and he completes the work he started in us. And so to answer your question about wokeism and when I was in, in the movement, uh, I tell people this, that I was, I was woke before I was a Christian. Uh, it was the environment that I grew up in. I grew up having an angst toward white people. Um, I wasn't, um, I didn't hate white people, uh, but I didn't trust them because that was the environment that I lived in. That was the music I listened to from Tupac and Biggie and Nas and that that culture, right? I, I listened to that music. That was the, 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 those were my people, right? Black people were my people. My stepfather was black. I was raised in an all black context. And so I saw myself as black, more than Puerto Rican, you know? Um, and, and, and that was significant because in, the, in that culture where I grew up in, um, there was this angst toward white people. There was this angst toward uh, the government and police. And, you know, so, so that, was, that was my context prior to coming to faith in Christ. And then I got saved. The Lord saved me. Um, and uh, when, when I became a Christian, oddly enough, uh, all, all, the, all the things that I believed about white people uh, and about, um, you know, society and the culture and, and all those things, little by little, the Lord was renewing my mind, right? So I didn't see white people as oppressor. I saw them, their brothers and sisters in the Lord. Uh, and, and I didn't see them as people who were trying to um, hold me back or pushing me down and all these things, as I thought previously coming to faith in Christ. But then, but then I, I, as I grew in the Lord about 2000, I would say 2015 through 2016 is when, um, Colin Kaepernick took place. And we have uh, a lot of the, the public police shootings that we saw take place. And, the Black Lives Matter movement um, came into existence. Um, I, 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 I reverted back to the, the life and the thinking that I adopted prior to coming to Christ. But the difference now, which actually made it more deceptive, was um, there, were, there, there were a group of people that I could follow that actually held to the same ideas I had prior to being in Christ, who now had this veneer of Christ on the outside. Mm. And so they were right on the doctrines of grace and they were right on the Reformation and they were right on all these theological stances that I held now being an older, mature Christian. But they also adhered to ideas that I was familiar with prior to being in Christ. And so it was very attractive to me. Um, and so that's kind of how I was introduced to the movement. You know, mm -hmm. when I when I saw when I saw a young black man being shot down, it wasn't about me thinking through um, the details of the, the evidence or you know, feel, feel, kind of working through what was taking place. It was an identification with those are my people, right? Those those are, those are my people uh, being massacred in the streets and. Uh, those are my people who who are being minima, minima, minimized and who are being oppressed and so on and so forth. So I disconnected my people being Christians from my people ethnically. Mm. And I started to associate myself more with my ethnic people, people of the flesh, as I, more than I did with my people who were of the faith. Mm. Well, that's a good distinction. And you put your finger on something a moment ago that I think is particularly confusing for Christians trying to navigate these waters right now. And that's that you're following people who bear the name of Christ. They're, they've got the essentials of the gospel correct. Mm -hmm. They're, you know, they're, they're, 
people that it's not like you can point to a heresy, which, you know, for me, that's what's made this so hard to analyze because typically I'm more in the realm of progressive Christianity, which frankly, I think is a little easier to analyze because although certainly progressive Christians aren't uh, all the same, they generally tend to reject the same thing. So they're rejecting, uh, you know, substitutionary atonement. They're rejecting original sin. They're rejecting a future second coming of Jesus, generally speaking. So that's a little easier to identify. It's easier to say, hey, this is heresy, like we we need to stay away from this. It's much more confusing when it's coming from people where you look down the doctoral doctrinal statement and all the right boxes are checked. And so I'd love to ask you, when you found yourself sort of drawn back to it, after the Lord had done, you know, some sanctification in you after you got saved, you began to see things differently, then you get kind of sucked back in a little bit. What did the process look like of God walking you back out of that? And and what were some, maybe some thoughts you had, some some things you realized along that process? Yeah, sure. That's great. So there's a lot there. Um, you know, I, I was just talking to my wife about this because, you know, the ideas have consequences. And the ideas that I held to affected many people and one of those persons was my wife and my children. Um, you know, my wife is not a person of color, and um, it was it, it, th- there was th- there was a cloud over my life during that season, and um, that that cloud uh, had a direct impact on my wife. And uh, there were there there I, I was starting to get into ideas that were undermining the work of Christ, that were undermining the scriptures and the sufficiency of the word of God. Um, Christ was enough, but he really wasn't. And, um, you know, I, I, I love my wife and I accept my wife, uh, but she, 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 th- there's more that she needs to do, right? Mm. Uh, and, and there was always this, this more that she needs to do on the basis of her skin color. Because she she didn't meet the qualification, and, and which by the way she had uh, no ability to meet the qualification. Right, God providentially gave her the ethnicity and the melanin count that she had, uh, and so there was no way for her to ever meet um, the qualifications that I had laid out for her, and that the movement uh, and the ideology had laid out for people like her, and so it it just. I was I was in this cloud and it perpetuated uh, guilt on other people who didn't look like me, and so it was a very long and grueling process. Um, and and you know one one of the things that the Lord used throughout this process to bring me out of it was the very thing that God used to bring me out of my sin when I was not a believer, and it was the truth of God's word. You know, it was it was brothers being faithful to proclaim the truth of God's word, to love me enough to tell me that I'm wrong and not to pet my sin and not to allow me to embrace ideas that were not true. Uh, And unfortunately, I lost some really good friends in the midst of that. And um, I excused my actions by saying that they just didn't get it. They couldn't see. They were blinded. Um, and, and I'm thankful for them uh, as I look back, as I tried to make those relationships right. Uh, and I'm, I'm thankful for my wife and the other brothers that have come alongside and just continually point me to the truth, you know? And so that was really ultimately what the Lord used to bring me back. It was the truth of his word, you know, the truth about what Christ accomplished on the cross, the truth about our true identity in him, um, the truth about, um, you know, Christ satisfying the Father's wrath on my behalf. The, all those foundational key truths that we tend to think we can graduate from are the things that God used to bring me back to himself out of that movement. Now, when we think about becoming woke and becoming, I guess you could say, unwoke, it's almost like there's this aha light bulb moment when you talk with people who are in, you know, if we call it a movement or whatever we want to call it, it's sort of just this cultural tidal wave, really, more than anything. And it's like, you'll you'll see the Facebook posts from people saying, you know, I didn't see it before, but now I see it. And it's like, 
I yeah. once was blind, but now I'm woke. You know? yeah. So I'm wondering for you, was there, because um, you're describing this more as a kind of a long process of sanctification, was there an unwoke moment for you where you just went, oh my goodness, yeah. that that was wrong? Yeah, absolutely. There was. Um yeah, so so there was there was several things, and I did jot some notes down. I had a really good conversation with my wife prior to um, this recording, and you know it, it's neat to see. I I, I, w- I I lived in this time of what I like to describe as a fog, um, and it was a dark season in my life, and 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 so I was living that. But then it was neat to hear the perspective of my wife on how she felt on that, and and while I was going through that. And and she she pointed out a couple of things um, that led up to this aha moment. Um, you know, one of the things, and I and I think this is important for our listeners to to be reminded of. We're, we're told in Ephesians, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, right? This is a spiritual warfare, and the spiritual warfare that Satan wants to um, to to fight in this is a battle for the mind. So the mm-hmm. ideas, and um, he oftentimes will give you truth that's wrapped in lies. And so he, he so even the truth that he presents is a lie because it's not the whole truth. And so I was I was embracing lies that had a veneer of truth and one of the things that he did to me to make this attractive and appealing was he used my current life situation to 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 give me um uh, kind of fodder uh to to spark the flames for me to continue to believe this so during during this season uh when when I initially embraced the woke idea and the ideas and the ideology I was going through a really difficult time of transition uh, I was pastoring in Florida uh my wife and I um prayerfully decided to move back to New York uh, we were living in a one bedroom apartment with four children um uh, was excuse me with four people in total and it was just really depressing and dark um and I was trying to find my identity you know am I a pastor anymore am I not this is this was challenging and then I, I take a job that was just um this really difficult and hard to work and we were we were on food stamps and dependent on the government. And so it was just really, it was just, there was just so much that, that was taking place in my personal life. And then, and then here comes this, this worldview that kind of swoops me in that I was primed for. And, and in the midst of embracing all the things that I listened to, the books that I had read, the YouTube channels that I had listened to that was feeding this ideology the truth of God pierced right through all the lies. And I can't help but think of uh, Hebrews, right? That the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. And so here I am in the in the depth of this spiritual darkness, this depression, it's affecting my marriage, it's affecting my relationships. And then God is using the truth of his word to pierce right through. So there were several aha moments but I didn't really get them until they were kind of compounded on top of each other. And there's one significant one that I think of. I remember ironing my clothes in the room in preparation for the week. And um, I remember listening, stumbling across some videos by a guy named A.D. Robles. I'm listening to him and he's talking about this woke movement. And I was like, what is that? You know, and I'm listening to it. And as he's describing it, those are the things I believed. And those are the ideas that I was embracing. And they actually coincided with some of the other friends that were reaching out to me privately uh, and, and saying, E, like you're you're in the deep end here, like you're in the woods, this isn't right. And I remember calling my wife in the room, listen and, and say, I said, baby, listen, listen to this, like listen to what this guy is saying. And 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 I spoke to her about that today and she said, she said, baby, when you, when you said, when you were listening to the AD videos, I left the room praising God 
because my wife never embraced the ideas I believed. She was prayer for, praying for me. She was concerned for me because she saw the end of where those ideas were taking me. She said, Edwin, she, she, now she's looking back, she said, baby, if you, if, if you continue down those ideas, the end result would be then you couldn't be with me anymore because I, I was white and I am white and uh, I could never meet the qualifications for what this ideology resulted in the end. So God used a, a multiplicity of truth to bring me to himself. And I remember distinctly one time listening to these uh, these videos and it being, wow, I, I don't believe this anymore. Like I, I, I see now. And then it was just scripture coming to mind. And then I just started uh, listening to other brothers. I remember coming across the Just Thinking podcast. And I remember uh, coming across other brothers uh, who were faithfully proclaiming the truth. And it's just being like, yes, yes. Like I, I see it now. I believe it. And now just then, sorry. And then just afterwards, just being, uh, just really wanting to, give myself over to help rescue people who are drifting away into this ideology as well. Mm. You know, wanting to be a rescuer uh, for the wanderers uh, who were embracing this idea. That's good. You mentioned uh, a couple minutes ago this this concept of spiritual warfare. This is a battle in the, the for the mind, really. This, you know, in fact, uh, growing up, all those spiritual warfare verses— I, were interpreted one way. And when I really started studying theology, I was like, you know, this is mostly about taking every thought captive. All these words have to do with what's happening in your mind with deceptions. And of course, all deceptions coming from Satan, which the Bible describes as the father of lies. This is the father of lies who's coming up with all kinds of clever deceptions. And the deceptions are never going to be really overt. They're going to be really tricky. They're going to contain a lot of truth. There are going to be observations made that ring true in inside in some way, but either they're going to lead you to a false conclusion or they're going to sort of um, color that in a way that that sort of um, infects it with deception. And um, I hope it's okay that I quote you because you sent me a line in an email as we were preparing for this podcast that I thought was so powerful. And you were talking about uh, the father of lies and these deceptions. And you said he would rather us focus on social justice as opposed to upholding biblical justice. He would rather us focus on white guilt as opposed to looking at the one who took on our guilt. I wonder mm -hmm. if you could expand on that a little bit. Yeah, yeah, he, you know, it, it says that Satan was the most craftiest beast in the garden. Um, he he comes to steal, kill, and to destroy, and he will use he, you know, he's he's a street fighter. He'll take mm. dirt off the ground and throw it in your eyes, and he won't play fair. And he's he's diabolical and he's wicked. And if if he can't take our souls, which he can't, right? Christ, we're secure in Christ if we're truly in him. If, if, if he can't take away our salvation, then he will try to make it the most miserable sanctification mm. we can ever have. And I think, I think we need to be aware of that. We shouldn't be ignorant to his devices. And I, I, I look back and I see the devices of Satan um, he he loves to clothe things um, in garments that are um, th that that look good um, and that that look pious and that that use language that we can accept on the surface, uh, similar to the cults, right? They 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 use Jesus and they use church and the Bible, uh, but when you start to peel back those layers of what those words actually mean. Uh, you, you end up finding something completely other than what the scriptures teach pertaining to Christ and the Bible and the word of God and so on and so forth. And so, yeah, I, I, I think about, um, I, I really, so, so all that being said, I, I, I'm giving myself over and I have given myself over to really, um, to understanding um, this, this, the, the tactics of Satan. Um, and, and the way in which we understand the tactics of Satan is by familiarizing ourselves with the word of God. I think oftentimes um, we are, and I say we generally speaking, 
um, th there's a sector of Christianity that has given ourselves over to um, these popular Christian voices throughout the years that we have kind of propped up as our heroes. Um, and, and, and we have kind of put on stage as our defenders of the faith. And we've believed what they've told us. And, and those were true things. And, and yet Satan has, has used them similar to how he used Peter, right? Mm. Don't go to the cross, Lord. You know, mm -hmm. never, you can never do that. And, and Pete and Jesus tells Peter, get behind me, Satan. Right. And so in a lot of ways, many of the people that we respect and love have been used by Satan to embrace ideas that are poison, mm. but they've done so by giving us language that we have readily accepted in the past. And because we trust them, we should trust the ideas that they embrace as well. And so mm. there, there's just so many layers to Satan's tactics that that this is why it's imperative that we are people of the book and that we be people who are testing what people say uh, in light of the scriptures, because things sound real good. Uh, but then when you peel them back, they may not be exactly what they are presented as. And so I don't know if that answers your question, but there's so many, there's so much there. Yeah. So as a pastor, what do you think is missing or lacking uh, either in sermons that are being preached or messaging, like you mentioned, that's being um, put forth online and on big platforms or even in discipleship in local churches? What What is missing from that that's allowing this sort of woke Christianity to come into churches so boldly and frankly so quickly? Yeah, no, that's great. This, so, again, there's a lot. Um, I think I think one we have to keep in mind that the wheat and the tear grow together. Mm. So, so there are people who are in the church but are not of the church, right? And so those people um, who are not truly the Lord's um, are 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 going to uh, fall away, and 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 those people need to be evangelized, right? Um, the, the problem is, is that um, oftentimes people, we desire the people to know the Lord and to come to faith. And so we oftentimes have like a superficial um, uh, view of, you know, you know, okay, this person prayed the prayer or this person, um, you know, they, they've been, they've been walking with the Lord forever. And so of course they're a believer, right? So, so there's, so there's that sector. There's people who don't really know the Lord. Um, and but now they're in prominent positions, or now they have a following, right? And so, so, and and so now they have influence over people's life. So there's that group. But then there's people who um, who who really don't know the scriptures, like they're they're babes in Christ, and they don't know the Word of God, and yet they have a heart for people who have been oppressed or who've been victimized and who have gone through hardship because they can relate to that in their own lives, right? And because those people don't have a biblical uh, worldview and their minds are not steeped in the word of God, they, they, they don't filter what they see in society and in their own life or in the lives of others through the word of God. And I think that would be my biggest um, cry for all of us as believers is that we need to do a better job and I'm generalizing, but but each of us, we need to we need to have a more robust understanding of the sufficiency of Scripture, and practically we need to let everything filter through the Word of God. So when we when we put on the news, right, and we see um, someone being killed at the hands of a police officer, regardless of the color of their skin, what does the Bible say about justice? Mm. Um, you know, and, and and that question needs to filter through the word of God needs to test all of that. And so I think, so there's that. And then I think in the pulpit, we need to get back to the call of the minister of the gospel, right? Um, the, the man of God is to preach the word of God. The word of God is our final authority. 
um, we, we, our opinions, I'm sure, are great, right? Uh, our experiences, I'm sure, are great. But at the end of the day, we are people who have to be bound by the word of God. You know, the, the one message that we have is the message that God has given us in the 66 books contained in the word of God. That's it. And, and from the word of God, we need to communicate what God has spoken. And, um, and, 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 and I think, and I think that's, what's missing now, you know, again, I talk about this on my channel where people use the word of God and they rightly divide it, but then they are heretical in their application of the word of God. And I think that's another thing, right? So, so in our preaching, we need to be biblical and our application, we need to be biblical and it needs to be Christ centered. And the Holy spirit is the one who sanctifies, right? Mm -hmm. The Holy spirit is the one who will draw his people keep his people and finish the work that he started in his people. And so pastors need to, to, to stay in their lane, preach God's word and let the spirit of God sanctify his people. And we're not the heroes Jesus Christ is. And I think all those things put together and more are some of the things that we need to be thinking about as pertains to the local church and our call as pastors. One of the things that I think people are confused about is the difference between teaching the Bible and preaching a sermon where a lot of Bible verses are used. And so I'll, yeah. I'll give a, a practical example from my own life on this. Um, for many years, I didn't understand the difference between these two things. And um, in fact, just recently, I attended a church with, uh, with a friend who, this was not my home church, and it, it kind of was, it was bothering me that the pastor's quote unquote sermon was really more of a political message. And then mm -hmm. he was bringing in Bible verses from all over the Old Testament and the New Testament and filtering those verses into the political view that he was putting forward. And mm -hmm. I had a conversation with, with the friend after, and I just said, yeah, I said, you know, I, I wish that it would just be Bible teaching. And the friend was like, but it was. I mean, there was so much scripture. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, even when I had my experience in the progressive church, that pastor used more scripture than almost anybody I'd ever heard before. And mm -hmm. so, you know, as a pastor, as a Bible teacher, what do you want to tell people about what to look for, how to tell the difference between a, a pastor actually preaching and expositing the Word of God versus using a lot of Scripture, but it might not actually be teaching the Bible. Yeah, absolutely. That's good. Um, that that That's challenging. It is. Because, again, it's, it's good for you to have a heart to want to obey your leaders, right? That's, that's, that's good. That's biblical, right? Um, but we shouldn't be blindly obeying our leaders. Uh, we should submit to their leadership. Um, and, and, and again, this is important too. We, we should submit to our leadership, but that isn't um, a blanket statement for them to just do whatever they want with the word of God and with the people of God. And so we want to, we want to believe our pastors and, and as pertains to their uh, adherence to the word of God, we desire to do that. And, and yet we're called to be discerning and discernment, uh, comes from the word of God, right? When we, when we know what God has said, when we're, when we're growing, uh, in, in, in understanding God's word and believing what God has said, we actually are growing in discernment. We're able to discern truth from error. And so I, I would encourage, um, Christians this, you know, the Bible, it, it, it should be applied to all of life, right? Uh, when we think of the Bible has a lot to say about politics, mm -hmm. it does. And, and, and it gives us principles by which we should uh, discern truth from error and, and be able to to make wise decisions in the voting booth, right? Um, and, and it has a lot to say about justice. Uh, and it has a lot to say about every sphere of life, right? And it gives us principles and, and practical implications on how we should do those things. Um, but there, there are people who cherry pick the Bible and the cults do this, um, you know, and, and other religious movements do this as well. So I would encourage Christians, um, if, if they, 
right? If you're a Christian, you have the Spirit of God, right? The Spirit of God has been given to you uh, when you came to faith in Christ. And so you have the Spirit of God, and the Spirit of God will lead us and guide us into truth, right? That that's what that's what the scriptures teach us, right? And so when we hear something that just doesn't sit right with us, um, it's good that we ask questions, right? It's good that we bring that to the Lord in prayer. God, is that is that what James meant mm. when he said that? Uh, James, the writer, right? I, I love my pastor. I respect him. I hear what he's saying, but is that what James meant by what he said? And I think that's a good question to ask. Um, and then um, I think it's important for us to maybe seek out some answers, right? We can we can obviously ask our pastor and pastors, and we should. Uh, and then we should seek out the counsel of other believers and maybe even people who we may not necessarily agree with uh, on other matters up front. And, and just be Bereans and, and to ask and inquire and to pray and to be diligent. I think that's important for the average layperson, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, that doesn't mean to be skeptical about everything your pastor says and to be oh, you know so critical that you can't receive anything. Yeah. Um, but but if but if these alarms come up in you, and and they're not in alignment with what you think the scriptures teach, um, then 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 we should we should investigate, we should ask, we should pray, we should, you know, pursue an answer that is adequate and align and in alignment with the Word of God. We should do that. Yeah, that's good. So as a pastor. There might be pastors listening to this. There might be pastors' wives listening to this uh, who, you know, can have conversations with uh, their pastor husbands or the pastoral staffs or mm-hmm. just people in church leadership. It, as a pastor, if you see some of these ideas coming into your congregation, um, maybe there's a staff member that's starting to express some of these ideas. Maybe there's even an elder or just congregants that are expressing these woke ideas within the context of Christianity, as a pastor, what advice would you give to other pastors about how to handle that? How do we, like, let's get real practical here. What What do you do when you see that coming into a church that you're uh, an elder, uh, uh, you know, over? Yeah, that's a great question. And and I think, I think this is important for us to keep in mind that there are nuances. Um, there are nuances to the degree of wokeism that you embrace and you know, talk about CRT, you know, how, how, how far is an individual from, you know, believing in, um, you know, systemic racism into whiteness into all these other categories. Right. And so I think this is why the local church is so vital and so important is because, um, every Christian should be involved in the local church. They should have pastors, right? A pastor or pastors watching over their soul. They should have uh, brothers and sisters that are keeping them accountable and watching their life and their doctrine. All that is important. And I think um, as, as a pastor, you're, you're, um, you're taking, you're, you're, you're taking a given situation and you're evaluating it based on, the situation at hand, right? And so with with some people, when you think about this with Christ, right? Uh, when when Christ dealt with um, the woman at the well, he dealt with her in, in a specific way, right? Uh, that was different than the way he dealt with the religious leaders. Um, and, and yet he didn't shy away from the truth. He got to the heart of the matter, but he was a surgeon, right? With the truth of God's word. And uh, so, so I think as pastors, just very practically, I think we need to know our people. Uh, w- we should be educated on the dangers that are confronting the church. Um, and we shouldn't shy away from dealing with issues when needed to be dealt with. Now, that doesn't mean that we should uh, confront every issue in the same way. And this is what I'm kind of getting at, right? So there may be someone who um, who 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 believes racism exists and and absolutely that's that's good because it does it does exist and unfortunately there are people who name the name of Christ who adhere to racist ideas and those people need to be spoken to about that and 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 yet so as a pastor you you take a given situation of someone embracing ideas uh, or toying with ideas that are uh, dangerous. 
you need to have a conversation with that person. Um, you know, what, what's going on? You know, what do you think about this? What are you thinking? What are you feeling? And then depending on where that person is. So if this is a fellow elder, uh, it, it needs to, to, to be at, at a higher level because this person has teaching influence. This person has discipleship influence, right? Uh, if it's someone who's a new Christian and is struggling with these things, then you need to also deal with that and confront that head on. But this is also, um, um, they need some discipleship. They need some training. They need a mentor. They need someone to come alongside them. So I, I would say that there's different spheres of this, right? I would say lastly, um, for a wife, I think obviously first and foremost, she needs to be praying for her husband or the leaders of the church uh, who may be embracing this and and prayerfully thinking about ways to um, to to steer an individual in the right direction, whether it be through resources such as this podcast or books. Uh, I know Thaddeus wrote a book, uh, Confronting Injustice, right? Uh, and, and, and there's different means that, that God will use to draw someone back to the truth. But primarily, you need to see the error and confront the error uh, in a way that is loving, but not getting away from speaking the truth. We mm. can't, we can't win people back to the truth without using the truth, right? We mm. have to use the truth. And um, you, 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 you may not know how to articulate the truth the best way or the clearest way, but nonetheless, the spirit of God will always use truth to, to bring people to himself or back to himself. So we can't get away from the truth. That's good. And I'm glad you mentioned Thaddeus Williams' book, uh, Confronting Injustice Without Compromising Truth, because your story is featured in that book, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yes, so is. we've had Thaddeus on the podcast. So if people are watching or listening, go back into the archives and check that out. Um, I, Edwin, I'd love to ask you the same question, but on the flip side. So someone's in a congregation, they're, they're a congregant of a church, they're, uh, and they are members of a church, and they're noticing the messaging from the plat platform becoming more and more in line with this woke Christianity. They're seeing their pastors focus less on the atonement and the gospel and more on what we might call social justice issues and things like that. What do they do? What would your advice be to them? Yeah, they need to they need to have a conversation with their elders uh, and give them their concerns. And depending on the elders' response, um, you know, maybe the elder doubles down. And um, you know, again, and and unfortunately, this 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 boils down to: is the pastor white or is the pastor black, um, or is the pastor a person of color or not? Because um, I, I, you as a congregant, are you white or non-white? You know, and, and unfortunately, these are the, these are the games that have to be played because, uh, if you're a black pastor or a person of color and you are, um, a white congregant that is going to them, um, th there is a certain perspective that the pastor is going to have, uh, you being the white person coming to them, you know, you, uh, you just don't want to hear this because of white fragility. So I, I would say you you speak to the pastor, you bring your concerns to the pastor. If you know, this is almost like the reverse of Matthew 19, right? The other side of the coin. So like you, you, you actually the 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 the, the elders um for an individual who is in sin is to privately go to this individual and they are to have this conversation if the person doesn't repent then you bring another witness and and so on the flip side of it you go to the elder and you say pastor i'm concerned these are some of the things you're teaching this is some of the things you've said this is when you said it uh this was the context in which you said it uh, i disagree and the pastor let's say he doesn't receive that now you should bring another brother with you by virtue of accountability and, you know, uh, to to verify that this was said and this conversation happened. Hey, pastor, we are concerned. And I think at some point, if there isn't repentance or if there isn't um, a, 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 a full throttle acknowledgement that this is something that is problematic, then at some point you need to leave the church. And I, I say that 
as an individual who's in that situation, you need to leave the church, but but also for the sake of your families. So if you're married, for the sake of your wife as a husband, uh, for the sake of your children, right? You're, you're, you're making disciples in the home and a part of the extension of that discipleship in your family's life is also the local church. And so you may be against those ideas and you may be having conversations with your pastor, but but your wife and your children are also, um, whether consciously or unconsciously, in being taught ideas that you believe to be antithetical to the word of God. And so at some point, if things don't change, um, you have to leave. Um, and when you do leave, uh, I, I I can't say black or white whether or not to leave quietly or not. And I don't mean to you know, throw chairs or anything of that nature, but I mean, uh, there may be times when you need to let others know exactly why you left. Um, pastors been teaching ideas that are uh, uh, antithetical to God's word. I'm concerned. I've had several conversations with him. This is this is why we're leaving. We love him. We love you, but we cannot remain here. And I would implore you to leave as well if this does not change. And I think I think that form of accountability is vital, right? Because that may be the very thing that God uses to bring forth true transformation out of this movement. That's good. Well, in a moment, we're going to do our Patreon-only subscriber portion of the interview. This is where Patreon supporters get to ask the questions to my guest. If you'd like to know more about that, you can go to patreon.com slash Alisa Childers. Take a look at the different tiers. Uh, one tier will give you early access to podcasts like this one. Uh, if you go a level up, you're going to get access to the bonus content that we're about to record. Uh, if you go a level up from that, you get a part to be a part of a Facebook group that's private for Patreon. Patreon supporters only, where we do a monthly live stream. But that's also where you get to ask the questions to my guests for our uh, special bonus content for uh, Patreon supporters. But as we uh, go ahead and we close out this portion of our discussion today, Edwin, I want to give you the last word. I always like to give my guests the last word. What would you say to people, just anything that's on your heart, whether it be to somebody who might be tempted by uh, these kind of ideas, maybe somebody who's intimidated by them, they may know the truth in their heart, but they're afraid to say anything because they're going to get called a racist or they're going to you know, get called different names. Um, go ahead and leave us with some, some pastoral thoughts, whatever you want to say just on this issue today. My last words to those who are listening is this. Soak yourself in the person of Jesus Christ. Read the word of God and see what Christ accomplished on your behalf. And when you look at the beauty of Christ and what he accomplished, and you look at the life that you now have in him and how you are hidden in him and how you are joint heirs with Christ and how you've been united to Christ, when you see the beauty of what Christ accomplished, everything, every other ideology, every other idea pales in comparison to the beauty and the excellency of Christ. And I would say, steep yourself in the epistles, as Paul and the other writers of the New Testament write to the local churches, and put yourself uh, as, as a recipient of what those writers have written to the church and be encouraged and be nourished and be satisfied in that. And then I would uh, encourage you to just continue to pray to that end, that God would do that in the life of your brothers and sisters who are believing uh, ideas. Maybe they believe the very things that you believe doctrinally, but they add a plus sign to the end of what Christ accomplished. I would say pray wholeheartedly for them that God would remove uh, veils uh, or scales over their eyes, over their hearts, that would help them to see, not only to see, but to believe in their heart of hearts what Christ has accomplished. And I would say, that's enough, right? And, and that's really, again, to close with the proverbial life. That, that's the desire. We want to look to Christ. That is our desire as Christians. 
and 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 in looking to Christ, we live wisely and we desire to leave a legacy behind for generations to follow. So keep doing what God has called you to do, outlined in the Word of God, and you will be pleasing to the Lord, and you will make many disciples for His glory and for His namesake. And that's it. Well, I want to thank my guest, Pastor Edwin Ramirez, today for joining me with such a rich discussion on what we're seeing huh, coming into so many of our churches and into the church at large. I want to thank you all for watching. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure you subscribe and click that bell icon because that lets you know every time we release a new video. If you're listening on audio platforms such as iTunes or Google or Spotify, always helps if you leave a good review. It just works with the algorithms to get the message out to more people. So be sure and do that. Be sure and comment on Facebook or Instagram or wherever you see this podcast show up. Thanks so much and we'll see you next time.